All right, we just want to take a second to welcome all of you that are joining us online tonight. So glad to have you, and we're going to have just a moment of prayer here, and then we'll get right into the teaching tonight. Father, we do thank you tonight, Lord, for your word. And uh, Lord, we hook faith together tonight, in, people in the building, people online. And we are asking you tonight to manifest yourself in the service and meet us tonight in the service and through your word. We thank you for giving us eyes that see and ears that hear. Help us, Lord, to receive what you have for us to receive tonight. And we agree together asking you tonight to give me the ability and anointing and grace to minister your word just the way you'd have me to. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs 16, have you found that there? We've been on a series on Wednesday nights entitled FaceTime. We've been on this now for eight, nine weeks, I think. If you haven't been here or been at all of them, you can uh, go back and catch up on the website online. You can even go back on Facebook and watch them there. And uh, those of you that have been here at a lot of them, would you tell somebody else that, yeah, you should go back and listen if you miss some because the Lord's really been ministering to us and helping us. And, and uh, we, we work in a way in our, in our teachings that we don't, we don't go back every week. You know, we just start from where we left off last week. And uh, so it might help you to go back and, and, and feed your spirit on some of those things the Lord spoke to us already. Proverbs 16 and verse 15 has been our foundation scripture in this series that we've been on. And it says this, that in the light of the king's countenance, there is life. In the light of the king's countenance, there's life. God's face shines, doesn't it? It radiates with his glory, with his goodness. And wherever, his, wherever that face turns towards, wherever that face shines towards, there's life there, isn't it? And uh, we, we looked at scriptures early on in the teaching where, where that in the light of God's countenance that we saw that God's countenance would give people strength, that it would cause people to be healed, that it would cause people to flourish and to increase. And how would it happen? It would happen just because God would turn his face on them and the power and the glory and the goodness that flowed out of his face would begin to minister to people and, and, and fix whatever was wrong or whatever they were going through, right? Um, put up uh, Psalm, uh, look, you go to, go to this one, Psalm 34. And I wanted to look at a, a scripture there that we looked at uh, real quick, Psalm 34. So the glory, Psalm 84, verse 11, you're going to Psalm 34, but Psalm 84, verse 11 said that the Lord is a sun and a shield and that he gives, he gives grace and glory and withholds no good thing from them that walk uprightly. That's good news, isn't it? He's not, God's not, <laughs> people get religious and get the wrong idea. God's not withholding good stuff from you and me. Jesus died so that you and I could have the good stuff. <laughs> and, and, and when you get born again, make him Lord of your life, you get the good stuff. But uh, it says that he gives grace and gives glory. He's a sun and a shield. So we talked about that. The sun gives warmth and it gives light. It, it just radiates that. It emits that every day, all day. Well, God is like that with grace and glory. He emanates grace and glory, grace and glory. But you know the only way to get any warmth and light from the sun is to get out in it, right? And, you, and, and in the same manner, in the same light, the only way to start receiving of that grace and that glory is if you turn your heart and your eyes and your mind towards the Lord. Psalm 34, uh, verse uh, 5, Psalm 34, verse 5 says this. It says, they looked unto him. There it is. They looked unto him and were lightened. The, the, the Amplified Bible, I think, says they became radiant. Radiant with what? Radiant with glory, with grace. And how did, they, how did they become, how were they lightened? They were lightened when they did what? When they, when they looked at him, they got lit. <laughs> right? And it goes right in there with 2 Corinthians 3.16 that talked about that we are like mirrors. And as we look at the Lord, we reflect what we look at we, we, as we behold his glory we grow in glory from glory to glory. And the idea is there is that a mirror can only reflect what it faces. And if I have a mirror but it faces opposite of me, it can't reflect me. But if it turns and faces me, then whatever it's facing, it would reflect. And if you turn towards the light of his face 
and His face radiates with grace and glory, then you would reflect the grace and the glory and the light that's coming out of Him. You would reflect it because you faced it, because you're a mirror, right? Would anybody in here testify that there's might have been five minutes in your life where you weren't looking at the Lord? Anybody had five minutes of that? Somebody said, yeah, I had five days of it last week. Well, when you, when you turn, say, say you've got something going on in your life and, and, and it's ca- trying to cause you to worry or, or torment you or, you know, whatever it may be. If you turn your heart and your mind and your thoughts and your attention on that circumstance and how it's not, how it's not working and not changing, what happens to you? You're not reflecting grace and glory because you're not facing Him. And you can be in the middle of that situation, and if you just turn and face Him and look at Him and don't look at that, then you'll begin to reflect what you face. So this this glory and grace that flows out of God's face, it's vital to our life and well-being. You're just not going to make it very far if you're not turning your eyes and your heart and your mind towards Him and keeping it on Him. And um, go with me to uh, Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7, and we'll pick it up where we left off last week. It's vital to your life. You know, I've done it. Whenever you turn your mind or your heart away from Him and fixate on something in your life that's not going right, a problem that you're having, fear that's trying to come on you, depression, you turn and and fixate on that, and what begins to happen is it begins to darken you, it begins to weaken you, begins to bring you down. Why? Because in the light of His face, there's life, there's strength, there's grace, there's help. But the only way to receive of that is to to turn your heart and mind and eyes towards Him and to look at Him. And if you cut yourself off from that, you start to go down and get weaker, don't you? Thank you, Lord. Proverbs 7, have you found that? Now, this becomes foundational for you and me as believers. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 9, I think it's in verse 62. He said, no man... Uh, putting his hand to the plow and looking back, say looking back. <laughs> no man put it, that has put his hand to the plow but looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And th- the truth is this, that you can't function in God's kingdom if you're not going to look in the right direction. Did you hear it? That was worth you coming your, combing your hair, coming to church tonight, putting your clothes on. You can't function in the kingdom if you're not going to look the right direction, you and I must, this is foundational, we must keep our eyes on Him, fixed on Him, looking at Him. Why? Because then the stuff that He radiates, I begin to receive of. And if I look at Him, I can get strengthened and I can get helped and I can get encouraged and I can get built up and my faith can come up and I can receive my healing and I can receive my freedom and whatever it is if I look at Him. Thank you, Lord. And what happens is detrimental and destructive things happen to us when we look away. Would you agree? When we look away, bad stuff starts happening. And this is what happened to Peter. Peter was walking on the water going to Jesus, right? Who's he looking at? (laughs) He's looking at the Lord. And in the light of the king's countenance, there's life. And as he was looking at Jesus, anything that he needed to walk on the water, he was getting, wasn't he? And then it said, but the wind, boisterous, started to blow harder, louder, just like the enemy, blows harder and louder. And then it said, Peter, when he saw the wind, so now what was he looking at? He's not looking at the Lord. And when he turned away from the Lord and stopped looking at Him, the grace that he needed to walk on the water was cut off. And he fell, not because God wanted him to fail, he fell because of where he looked. Is it important that you and I look at the right place? Thank you, Lord. Everybody doing okay so far? It's imperative. It's foundational. We, we've, not, we've not put the weight on this, and we'll see it tonight, that we should have. I can't afford to take my eyes and my mind and my heart off of the Lord. That's when the bad stuff's going to start happening. Why? Because I, when, I tur- when I turn my heart and my mind on that thing, I've turned it away from Him. And I can't reflect and I can't receive of what I won't face. Proverbs 7. Have you found that? Thank you, Lord. Let's, let's look some here. We, we finished up here last week. Let's start here tonight. Thank you, Father. 
When does the bad stuff start happening? When do you start getting weaker? When do you, when do you start going down? When you look away. Now here's, here's what we want to talk about tonight. Because that's true, there is a very real pull from the enemy to try to get you to look away. And, and it's a temptation. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pulling. Trying to get you to, to look at this. Isn't that what he did to Peter? He's trying to get him to get his eyes off of Jesus. And he, and he was successful that day. And, it's a, and, there, and you will be tempted. You, you will be pulled to focus on and look at and think about stuff that you shouldn't think about. Anybody ever experienced any of this? <laughs> I didn't have to ask to know the answer. I just wanted to hear you talk back to me for a second. Yeah, it, and it's real. And, 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 and about the time you finish the word amen, the temptation's there to start looking at the problem. And halfway through your confession to start thinking about how it's not changing and it's not working and, and there's a pull, isn't there? And that's what the enemy's trying to do, trying to pull on you to get you to not look at the Lord. And to get you to look at, well, gosh, you've been praying for them. It don't look like they're changing. And you've been believing for this and it doesn't look like this happening. And you've been battling depression and anxiety and, and you prayed and, and it still feels like it's there. I mean, look at how you feel. Look at it. Look at the symptoms. Right? And he, and he would help you, wouldn't he? And he would try to help you to get you to look at it. You ever, you ever saw something online and said, saw the 10 signs of depression and, and you clicked on it? And, and you, you, you re started reading and you thought, oh dear God, I got seven of them. I must be depressed. I laugh at some of those commercials. If you're tired or, 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 or anxious about something or, you know, uh, whatever, worn out, I mean, half the world feels like that every day when they wake up. <laughs> I mean, you just described 70% of people walking the earth. And what I'm, my point is this, the enemy will have you fixate on that stuff and pull on you to get you to look. Look at it. It's not working, not changing, not happening. Look, look. Has he ever said that? Look. What's he wanting you to look at it? And you and I, what we got to do is we got to not look and not yield. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And the Lord would help you to not do it. Proverbs 7, verse 1. Thank you, Lord. He says this, my son, keep my words. Lay up my commandments with you. What's he talking about? He's talking about his words, isn't it? Keep my commandments. You hear in verse 2? Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of your eye. Now, I want you to focus on that phrase and keep my commandments and live. Now, we've been talking the past couple weeks about this idea of look and live. Remember when we talked about it? We've talked about the last couple weeks when they got in Numbers chapter 21, when they got started getting bit by the serpents. And, and Moses went to the Lord and, and said, Lord, help us with this. You know, make this stop. And the Lord said, well, put a, put a brass serpent up on a pole. And he said, when anybody looks on it, he'll live. When he does what? When he looks. Why? Because in the light of his countenance, there's life. Now, what's this scripture saying? This scripture is saying, keep my commandments and live. This word keep means to, not just to obey them. Of course, it's talking about obey them. But this word keep means to behold them, to pay attention to them, to treasure them up. One word I found that it means to observe. Say observe. A couple other translations say this scripture like this. <coughs> Excuse me. Pay close attention to my words. One of them says, remember them. I like this, the Living Bible. Always keep them in mind. Guard my words as your most precious possession. How are you going to guard something if you take your eye off of it? How do you protect somebody? Keep your eye on it, right? Um, the uh, HCSB says, protect my teachings as the pupil of your eye. Keep my teaching with with all, keep my teaching with you all the time. Remind yourself of them. What's he talking about? He's talking about looking at it, keeping your mind on it, keeping your eyes on it. The Message Bible says this: Do what I say, and you'll live well. My teaching is as precious as your eyesight. 
Guard it. Write it on the back of your hands. Etch it on the chambers of your heart. Come on, what's he talking about? He's talking about look at it. Keep your thoughts on it. Keep your mind on it. Focus on it. And if you did, what would you do? Look and live. Now, let's not get too dark here, but what if you don't look? <laughs> what if you don't keep them? What if you don't pay attention to his words? What if you look somewhere else? Then you wouldn't live, you'd die. Now, we're, again, we're not talking just about physical death. We're talking about being weakened and being pulled down. Now, this is the, ti the title of the message the last couple of weeks was Look and Live. Tonight, the title of the message is Look and Die. And if you look at the wrong thing, you're going to start coming down. And he's telling them, treasure my words. Keep them on your heart. Keep them on your mind. Pay attention to them. Lay them up. Then verse 3 says this, bind them upon your fingers. Write them on the table of your heart. Uh, Jewish people... This, there, you can look up these words, phylactery. Anybody ever heard of that? I hadn't heard of it until now. <laughs> but it's what, what, they, what these Hebrew uh, Jewish people do is they take this little black box and they write scriptures on paper and put them in there. And, and they'll, the, it's on a leather strap and they la wrap that strap around their arm and around their hand and that box stays on their finger. Anybody ever tied a string around your finger so you would remember to do something? This is the same idea, right? The Three Stooges used to do that and then couldn't remember what any of the strings meant. But this is what they're talking about. Why would you write... Some, you, how about this one? This might be a little bit more real to you. Ever written something on your hand so you wouldn't forget? What, why do you write it down? So that you'll, you'll keep looking at it, right? So that you'll keep your eyes on it. This is the idea when he says, bind it on your finger, look at it. Why? Because if you look at it, what's going to happen? You're going to live. You're going to, you look up the word live and you're going to live prosperously. You're going to be quickened. If you do what? If you, you're not helping me again with this tonight. Come on. If you, do, if you do what? If you look, you live. Right? If you turn and don't look, you die. You start to go down. And uh, we know this in James chapter 1. It talked about that, you know, only the person that continues to look at the word is going to be a doer of the word. So this all flows together. If you keep it in front of your eyes, you'll put it into practice in your life. And this is why he says, keep my commandments and you'll live. If you don't keep them in front of your eyes, you're not going to be a doer of the word. So what's he say? He says, write them on your heart. Wrap them around your finger. Pay attention to them. Keep your mind on them. Remind yourself of them. Look, right, at his word and you'd live. Now keep reading here. This is in uh, verse 4. He said, say unto wisdom, you're my sister. And call understanding your kinswoman, that they may keep you from the strange woman, from the stranger, which flatters with her words. For at the window of my house I looked through a casement and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a man, a young man, void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went by the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening in the black and the dark of the night. Now, what does he lack? He lacks understanding. And we're going to come back and talk about this as we go tonight, but I want you to just remember this. He's doing this because he lacks understanding. He's void of understanding. And we'll come back to that. But this strange woman this, 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 uh, that the Scripture called her, this is a type of the enemy, isn't it? We're not just talking about somebody committing adultery. This is how that happens. Naturally, that happens the same way, but we're talking about uh, yielding to the enemy. He, he's representative and a type of this strange woman. Now, I want you to look at this down here uh, in verse 10. It said, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and was subtle of heart. Say subtle. Subtle of heart. Subtle means deceptive, lying, right? deceptive and lying and this is the enemy's tactic all the time wanting you and i to believe something that isn't true ephesians chapter 6 uh, verse 10 said that you and i are supposed to stand against the wiles of the devil you look up the word wiles and it means the deceit the lying he wants you to believe something that's not true something that is in opposition to this 
And what are we supposed to stand against? We're supposed to stand against his lies and not believe his lies. One of the favorite lies he likes to tell you and me is it's not working. Why would he be so hard on you to try to get you to believe it's not working? Must be working. <laughs> Otherwise, he wouldn't be messing with you about it. He'd just let you be. He'd like you to think it's working when it's not working. And, and he'll, he'll just get, your prayer's not going to get answered. It's not happening. It's not changing. Lie. He told me something today, and I just said, Satan, you're a liar and the father of it. Just popped his balloon, man. He just left. I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to believe what the Word says. How about you? Amen. And what's this adulterous woman? She's subtle, just like the enemy, crafty, deceitful, lying. And uh, verse 5 said that she flatters with her words. Her words are her weapon. How about the enemy? His words are his weapon. James, uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 3 and 8 there talk about that how he, that he shoots uh, these arrows like words. These, his words that he speaks, they're like ear, arrows and they try to pierce you and me. And how do, how do we hear his words? We're not hearing them with our physical ear. They come as negative thoughts, Amen. negative feelings. You ever have a thought and you think, where'd that come from? Yeah. You ever been behind a, a lady in line and she was taking so long to write a checkbook, you had the thought, I just want to slap this woman in her face and grab her checkbook and throw it on the ground. You never had that thought? Okay, well, forgive me. I guess I might have. But where do thoughts like that come from? From the enemy. They're not your thoughts. He fires these things at you. And, and his words are his weapons. And what's he trying to do? Trying to get you to believe what he's saying. Because that gives him place in your life. Keep reading about this woman. What else about her? She uses his, her words... She's subtle, she's a liar. And what else? Verse 11, she's loud. You ever felt like the enemy was so loud? You ever had so many wrong thoughts coming so quickly? And it was like so loud, just like every other thought was negative and it's loud and you can't shut it up and you can't shut it. Ever felt like this? This is one of the tactics of the enemy. We just talked about it in Matthew 14 when Peter was walking on the water to go to Jesus. He said he saw the wind boisterous. Boisterous means loud. What's he trying to do? Trying to get Peter's eyes off of what it's on and onto this loudness. Is this a picture of the enemy? What else about this woman? She's loud and she's stubborn. Stubborn means constant. There's this time I was going through something a few years back and it felt like I couldn't stop the wrong thoughts. They were coming so quickly. Now that's a lie. You can stop them anytime you want to and choose to. But they can feel like they're coming from every direction. This is this stubbornness, persistence, constant. You ever feel like the enemy won't leave you alone? <laughs> you know, you can turn it back on him and make him feel like, man, he'll never leave me alone. You can make him feel like that about you. You can wake up with the word in your heart and the word in your mouth and keep it on your heart and out, coming out of your mouth all day, every day. And you can cast down every wrong thought. Can you get on the other side of this? <laughs> right? You ever felt like he woke you up in the morning? You ever felt like that? First thing out and you have him immediately on it. Wake him up in the morning. Wake up with the word of God on your heart, coming out of your mouth. Praise on your lips. Could you have victory? She's loud. She's lying. She's stubborn. Using her words. Remember in, in, in uh, Luke chapter 4 when Jesus had resisted him three times and said, it's written, it's written, it's written. And then in verse 13 it said, and the devil left for a season. <laughs> What's that mean? That means he's probably going to come back. Why? Because he's persistent and he's constant. If you resist him, he'll flee and then he'll probably be back. And then you resist him again and you resist him again. Is this how this, is this, how this woman is? Stubborn. And then the next verse in verse 12 says that she lurks on every corner or lies in wait on every corner. That lies in wait means that she lurks. Is the enemy looking for opportunity in your or my life to pounce on you? And he wants you to relax and he wants you to put your guard down. 
And 1 Peter 5, 8 said that we need to be sober, be vigilant, be on guard, because there's an adversary out there, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He wants to sneak up on you, doesn't he? And uh, this is how he is. This is how he, he functions and operates, just like this woman does. This is, this is a type of, of the enemy. Now go down here to verse uh, 15. It says, therefore, well, I skipped some. Let's go back up. Verse 12, she lies on weight in every corner. Verse 13, 13 says, she caught him and kissed him with an impotent face and said unto him, I have peace offerings with me this day. I've paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet you diligently to do what? To seek your face. She goes on to say, I've decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. Say, looks good. What's, what's she telling about? My bed. Why is she telling him about her bed? Because she wants him to think about her bed and these fine sheets that he's thinking about rolling around in. She said, I've perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Smells good. Say, smells good. <laughs> Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with, or solace ourselves with loves. What's she talking about now? Feels good. Now, why am I saying this? Because the enemy is going to appeal to your senses. What you see, how you feel. Show you something, give you a thought, get you to feel something. You and I are supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. So we're not supposed to be moved by what we see. We're not supposed to be moved by how we feel. But your flesh, what you see and how you feel, appeals to your flesh. And he, he'll play off of it, won't he? And he's always, his, his, one of his favorite things is to try to say, look. Tell you, look, it's not changing. It's not happening. Don't you see how you feel? If you have joy, why do you feel depressed? And what's he want you to focus on? Your feelings. Your feelings. Well, if you're healed, then why do you still have the symptoms? What's he want you to focus on? The symptoms. Well, you've been praying for your kids. If they're changing, why are they still acting like this? What's he want you to focus on? What's not happening? What you see with your eyes. Is this what she's doing with him? And uh, back up in verse 15, what did it say? It said, verse 13 said, she caught him and she said, I came forth diligently to do what? To seek your face. Seek his face. What does she want? She wants him to look at me and put your focus and put your attention on, on me and put your eyes on, on me. Look at, look at me. And, and the, the, in verse 13, she actually said she caught him and kissed him. She's doing everything she can to get, him, get her, get this guy to look at her and put his eyes on her. And he goes on uh, down here, continue reading. Thank you, Lord. Verse 19, for the good man's not home, he's gone. What's she saying? My husband's not home. He took a long journey, took the bag with him, and, and he'll come home at a point. What's she saying? We've got plenty of time. We've got plenty of time. And verse 21, this is the verse we need to look at. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. The word forced him doesn't mean that she made him. It means that she led him. In the, in the last part of this verse, with her lips she forced him, she led him. And how, but how did she do it? With her much fair speech. A couple translations say that with the abundance of her words. The C CSB says with her persistent pleading. The NABRE says she wins him over by repeated urging. The Wyclef said she bound him with many words. She turned him aside with an, the abundance of her speech. What did she do? She just kept talking and just kept talking and just kept talking. Have you experienced any of this with the enemy? Just keeps saying it. Just keeps bringing it up. Just keeps reminding you. Just keeps giving you thoughts. Just keeps giving you feelings. feeling. And, and this happened to him so much, he finally just gave in and just yielded. And what did he yield? He yielded his eyes. He yielded his face. He yielded his attention and he started looking at her. And how did she get him to do that? She just wouldn't shut up. And finally, he got weak and just gave in. 
There's a scripture in 1 Peter 5.10 that says, You and I are supposed to resist the enemy steadfast. Stay steadfast. <laughs> steadfast. You know, you, you, if you have young children, about five, you'll get a definition of steadfast. Daddy, I need this. 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 Daddy. Yeah, yeah, anybody ever had any of this happen in their life? <laughs> you think, just shut up. You just give it to them. Just be quiet. This is steadfast. Just keeps just on and on and on and on. And we're supposed to resist him steadfast in faith. Now, why would God tell you to resist him steadfast in faith? Kind of gives you the idea that the enemy's not just going to come once or twice. <laughs> kind of gives you the idea that he's going to keep coming. And what do you do? You, you keep resisting. You keep resisting. That's what, how you and I respond to his persistent pleading. Let me go to Judges with me. Put a marker there. Let's go to Judges and look at a few verses in Judges. Everybody doing okay so far? Persistence is one of the main ways that the enemy gets people to yield their eyes. What was this woman after? I came diligently because I wanted your face. <laughs> I wanted you to look at me. And what's the enemy coming for you at? He's wanting you to look at, look at him. Because if you look at him... You start to go down, don't you? In Judges chapter 14, anybody ever heard of Samson? Listen to this. Judges 14. It says this in verse 15. It came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice your husband. Say entice. This is the enemy, isn't it? And uh, that he may tell us what this riddle means. Verse 16 says, And Samson's wife wept before him and said, you, you, Do you hate me and not love me? You've put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and have not told me, told, told me what it means. And he said unto her, Look, he said, I haven't told my mother or my father. Why would I tell you? Verse 17. What, what's he saying in verse 16? I'm not going to tell you. Is he giving in? Not yet. Verse 17. And she wept before him. Seven days. Say seven days. It came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, and why did he give in? Why did he tell her? Because she laid sore upon him. That just means that she pressed him. She just wouldn't shut up. And finally he just... See, this is a war of attrition with the enemy. He just wants to try to wear you down and wear you down and wear you down until you just say, fine, and you just look at it. <laughs> Somebody said, is there any good news coming? There's good news coming. I'll just give it to you right now. You don't have to look. Let me, let me tell you something about your master, Jesus. He never looked at the enemy. He never focused on him. He never yielded his gaze. He never turned his eyes on him. Never, never, not once. Say not once. I got, I'm, I'm, I'm getting revved up now. You weren't getting excited about some of the other stuff. I'm going to give you something. Not once did he yield. Not once did he give in. Not once did he believe the enemy's life. Not once did he yield his thoughts. He was perfect, strong in faith. When the enemy came and tempted him and he said, it's written, it's written, it's written, that's not the only three times he did that. He did that every day, all day. This was his response. I'm not looking at it. Do you believe it? Somebody said, well, that's good news, but that's what Jesus, that's Jesus. Where does that leave my poor pitiful self? I mean, I'm not Jesus. You didn't have to tell me you're not Jesus for me to know that. I know you're not Jesus. But this is how he acted. This is how he lived. Anybody know what Philippians 4, 13 says? I can do all things through Christ who strength, which strengthens me. Now, why does that mean anything to you? Because Jesus did that, that not yielding, that not looking, that not giving in. He did that as a man, not as God. He did that as a man, flesh and blood, just like you and me. And how did he do it? He did it by the Spirit of God, by the grace of God, by the anointing of God, showing you and me that we could do the same thing. And when it said that we're, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, you look up the word Christ, do some study on it, you'll find it's, it means the anointed one and his anointing. 
And what it's saying is the same anointing that was on Jesus strengthening him to live the way he lived, that same anointing can come on you and enable you to live the way that he lived. And you could be strong and not give in and not look. But how does the enemy get victory over us so often? He just lays on us. And it's a war of attrition and he just eventually just hoping that you'll just give in. Come on, you need to say this right now. I'm not giving in. I'm not going to look. Could God help you? Could you get so strong on the inside, you just, you'll just be like your master and say, I'm not looking. <laughs> I'm, to look at that, I'd have to take my eyes off the Father. I'm not doing it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's look at another instance. Go, go over just to, this isn't the first time I preached. I'm dropping stuff and knocking stuff over. Um, Judges chapter 16. And look at this one. This is down here in verse 15. And this is talking about Delilah. Say Delilah. Delilah. And Delilah wanted something from Samson. She wanted to know where, her, where his strength came from. In verse 15 she said, How can you say you love me when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times and have not told me wherein your strength lies. And it came to pass when she... Well, now what's he doing the first thing? He's not telling her where his strength came. Three times she comes and he, and he won't tell her. Is he giving in? Not yet. Verse 16, and it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. What did she do? Pressed him daily and just urged him and just was on him with her words. And finally, what did he do? He just gave in. It's a war of attrition. And you have to have the mentality. My high school basketball coach used to tell a story about his high school basketball coach. And um, he used to say that, that his high school basketball coach made him run a lot. Made him run a lot of, uh, they call them, what they call them, the suicides is what they usually call them, or washboards. And it's, you're, you're, just, you're running a lot. And, and he was told a story. And he said, when I was in high school, I used to think to myself, I can, I can get on this line and run as many times as you blow that whistle. What's he saying? I'm going to outlast your whistle blowing. And what you need to have is the same mentality when it comes to the enemy. I can keep my eyes on the Lord and not look as many times as you try to get me to look at something else. I can take as many thoughts as you bring to me. I cannot re yield and not give in as many feelings as I have. As many things as you try to show me, as many as you can bring is as many as I can resist. It's a war of attrition. And you have supernatural ability grace and anointing you got a scripture that says you can do all things through christ that strengthens you that's not just something you put on a bookmark or something you put on a t-shirt that's something you live you live strength can come from the inside you can get so strong you just don't look man i'm, I'm getting excited about that thank you lord go back to proverbs 7 with me. proverbs 7 thank you lord what did he do? She, she pressed him, both of them, Delilah and, and this other one. They pressed him daily. They talked to him. And finally, he just, he just gave up and gave in. What's the good news? The good news is you and I don't have to give up. We don't have to give in. You know, there's a scripture in Romans chapter 6 that talk, tells you and I that you and I should consider ourselves dead to sin. Say dead to sin. So you, when, when you think about yourself... You should think about being dead to sin. And what that means is this. You know, Samson, Samson had a problem with Delilah, didn't he? He just had something about Delilah. You know, these women, he had this problem. And they would get all dolled up and, and he just liked Delilah. Well, do you know that if you gave Delilah a new makeover and put a, a beautiful dress on her and she just looked as pretty as she ever did, if she walked up, to a, a, a man's body in a casket and started whispering in his ear, don't you want me so much? Am I not so pretty? Do you know that he wouldn't have any problem not being affected by that? <laughs> Why? He's dead. So he doesn't have a problem. And you and I should be that way when it comes to the enemy, when he's trying to get you to look, just play dead. And just say, I'm not looking. You're talking to a dead man. This has, this has no pull on me to do this. I consider myself dead 
to all of your attempts, to all of your attacks, to all of your lies, to every wrong feeling, to every wrong thought. I'm dead to that. What's that mean? It has no effect on me. Thank you, Lord. Proverbs 7, have you? You back there? I guess we ought to start to wind this down. Persistence. Constancy. So often is how he gets people to yield their eyes. And, and what did this woman come seeking? Came seeking his face. Look at me. Look at me. This is what the enemy wants you to do. Look at him. And, and one of the main ways he does is just being persistent. Try to just wear you down. Do you know one of his greatest frustrations? One of the enemy's greatest frustrations is your resolution. And by resolution, I mean your resolve. You know, you resist him once and he tries to get you to look at something one time and you don't. And he just probably thinks, oh, well, oh, whatever, I'll be back. And then he comes back again and he tries to get you to, hey, look at this. And you go, no, I'm not looking at that. I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord. He just probably thinks, whatever, I'll be back. And he comes four or five more times, seven, eight, nine, ten times. And he just goes, okay, whatever, I'll be back. But as it starts to pile up, it's his greatest frustration when you won't change. When you, won't, you want to talk about frustration, you know, the enemy sends, you know, three devils to your house trying to get you to look for six months. They come back to headquarters and the devil goes, what about it? What about it? And they go, we don't know, boss. We have no effect on him. We can't get him to look at what we're saying. Frustrating, very frustrating for the enemy when he's trying to get you to look and you won't. Come on, say it. I don't have to look. <laughs> I don't have to yield. I don't have to give in. You don't have to. You can look and keep your eyes on the Lord, couldn't you? Um, Proverbs 7, verse 21, with her much fair speech, how'd she get him to yield? She wouldn't shut up. <laughs> Daddy, I'm hungry. Daddy, I'm hungry. Daddy, I'm hungry. <laughs> it just wears me down. I just, okay, fine. I'll just get you something to eat. <laughs> Daddy, I want this. Daddy, I want this. Daddy, I want this. Okay, okay, okay. Is this how the enemy works? Now, now, grace is not the enemy. <laughs> but this is how he works. You don't have to yield to him. You don't have to give in. And this is how he got her to yield. She got him to yield. Just wouldn't be quiet. And uh, it says here, with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. Verse 22, he goes after her. Straightway, immediately, as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction stock, till a dart strikes through his liver, as a bird hastens or flies to a snare or to a trap, and knows not that it's for his life. What's happening? We got a bird flying to a net, getting ready to die, but he, but he doesn't know that it's going to cost him his life. And this is what, this is the way that the word describes this man that's yielded his face to this woman. How does it describe it? Like an ox going to the slaughter. The ox doesn't know it's getting ready to be slaughtered. And the bird that's getting ready to fly into a trap doesn't know it's getting ready to fly into a trap. And it doesn't know that it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost him his what? It's going to cost him his life. If he keeps flying this direction. And this man, this, remember in verse 7 when we talked about in the beginning, what's he lack? He lacks understanding. He doesn't understand that following her is going to cost him his life. Look, when it said he, he's following her, follows after her, who's he looking at? When he's following after her, who's he looking at? He's yielded, hasn't he? He's yielded his eyes. He's yielded his face. He's yielded his mind. And he's looking at her, and he doesn't know that it's going to cost him his life. Um, the Message Bible says this, she has him eating out of her hand, bewitched by her honey speech, her honeyed speech. He's trotting behind her like a calf led to the butcher shop, like a stag lured into an ambush and shot with an arrow, like a bird flying into a net, not knowing its life is over. You lack understanding of what it, of what it costs. And that's why he went out, and that's why he went by her house, and that's why he's playing around with it, because he doesn't know what it cost. He just thinks it's no big deal, it's going to be okay, her husband's gone, I'll just go do it, beat about a boop, I'll come home, everything will be fine. He doesn't know it's going to cost him his life. And you and I 
When you give up your gaze, when you give up your thoughts, when you give your eyes to something the enemy wants to look at you, so often you're not understanding what that's going to cost you. It costs you your peace. It costs you your joy. It costs you your faith. It costs you the grace and the glory. That's what it costs to look. Come on, somebody say it costs too much. <laughs> you, ever, you ever think you want something to look at the price tag and think, I don't want it anymore. Cost too much. Cost too much. Well, there's a price tag on you yielding your eyes to the enemy and what he brings into your life. And it's going to cost you the light of God's countenance. That costs too much. I don't want to pay that price. I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord. And it's got to become more real to you and me what the cost is to give up our gaze, to give up our eyes and to, to look somewhere else because we haven't realized that while we're over here looking at what the enemy wants to get us to look at and focusing on it and thinking about it, we don't realize what it's costing us. It's costing you your life. It's costing you your victory. It's costing you your peace. I'm not paying that price. I'm not, not, not paying that much. Too expensive. Too costly. Come on, does he lack understanding? We got, it's got to be more serious to you and me when we just to sit there and decide to sulk all day. Did I say that right? I, meant to, I think I said soak. I meant, I meant sulk. It's got to be more serious to you and me. We just think, well, it's no big deal. You know, I, I don't really mean to. I know I shouldn't be, but I'm, I'm just worried about this right now. It's costing you. And we're like, you know, you're like a dumb ox going to the slaughter. Probably just thinks he's going for a ride somewhere and getting ready to be slaughtered. Not you and me, though. Not you and me. We're not going to look. Cost too much. Thank you, Lord. He goes on to say in verse 24, Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children. And do what? Attend to the words of my... What He's still saying, look at me. <laughs> Pay attention to me. Why? Because if you look at me, what's going to happen? You'll live. If you don't look, you'll die. Look at verse 25. Don't let your heart... The word heart there is referring also to your mind. Don't let your heart or your mind turn. Say turn. Is this what we're talking about? He's saying don't let your heart and your mind turn towards her. Why? Because that's going to cost you your life. But instead do what? Pay attention to me. Pay attention to me. Look at me. Because in the light of my countenance, if you look at me, you'll receive grace. You'll receive glory. You'll receive life. You'll receive help. You'll receive strength. Don't look at her. Look, look at me. Don't turn your mind. Don't turn your heart. Don't turn your, your mind and your heart aside to her ways. Verse 26, why? For she's cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her, by her, and her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Is it going to cost him something if he looks? Put Ecclesiastes 11.7 on the screen, and let's just read this as we're finished. What's this whole chapter about in Proverbs 7? What's the whole chapter about? Don't look at that. Look at me. Why? Because if you look at it, you're going to die. Now, I'm not talking just about physical death. I'm talking about dying on the inside, being pulled down, being weakened. I started off the chapter, if you look at my words, you'll live. But what if you look at her? What if you look at the enemy? You're, if you're looking at him, then you're turning away from the glory. Come on, don't turn away from the glory. Don't turn away from this grace and this glory that emanates from the Lord who is the sun and the shield and the light of His face, there's life. Don't, don't turn away. Don't turn away. Say, don't turn away. No, I'm not going to turn away. When the enemy pulls and when he comes and lies and when he gives me thoughts and when he shows me circumstances and when he shows me an evil report and, and I have a bad feeling and it looks like it changed, I'm not going to look away. I'm not going to turn away. If I do, it cost me. Ecclesiastes verse 7, look what this says. Truly... The light is sweet. Do you believe it? And it's a pleasant thing for the eyes to do what? To look at the sun. Now, is that true? Now, listen. Go outside tomorrow and look at the sun. and Think about what it's going to do for your eyes. It hurts. This ain't talking about natural stuff. 
This is talking about spiritual stuff. <laughs> it's pleasant to your heart. It's pleasant to your life when you turn your face towards the Lord. Praise the Lord. Stand to your feet with me tonight. Thank you, Lord. Did the Lord help you tonight? Come on, we got some choices, don't we? We can look and live, or we can look and die. Which one do you want? <laughs> Which one do you want? Come on, I don't know about you, but I want to look and I want to look and live. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, just bow your heads for a moment, close your eyes, and and focus on the Lord. You know, many people in the building tonight, many people watching online tonight, maybe watching later even. You may be thinking that I hear what you're saying, but these thoughts I'm having are, are, are overwhelming. They're too much. They're, they're too much. I hear you. I know what you're saying. I know it's true, but I don't know how. I don't know how to, to start this. I don't know how to put this into practice. I don't know. I don't see how. I don't know how. The Lord would help you tonight. He would minister to you and strengthen you and give you grace and help to put into practice what He showed you tonight from His Word. And I want to encourage you tonight, this is how, this is how you combat those feelings. This is how you combat those thoughts. Those thoughts that you can't do it, that it's too much, it's too overwhelming. You start declaring this out your mouth, I can do all things through the anointing which is strengthening me. You start beginning to declare that over your life. And start saying about yourself what the Word says about you. I can cast down every thought. I can resist every feeling. I can keep my eyes on the Lord no matter what comes. I can do it by the grace and by the strength of the anointing that lives in me. And Father, we thank you tonight. Those of you that those are the those people that have called out to you, those people that that was their heart's cry, that I hear it, I see it, but I don't know how to put it into practice, Lord. We thank you for helping them, strengthening them, giving them grace and giving them help, building them up. Help them to not fixate on what isn't changing, to not fixate on what they don't know and what they don't understand. Help them to turn their eyes upon you. The psalmist said, Lord, help Help me, help my eyes to not behold vanity. Help me to not look at the wrong things. Lord, we're asking, you said ask and we would receive. We're asking you in faith tonight that you'd help each one of us to put this into practice and to keep our eyes on you no matter what the enemy throws at us. And we thank you in advance for the grace and for the strength and for the help to keep our eyes on you, to turn our heart and our mind towards you, towards the light of your countenance. And as we do, Lord, we thank you for the grace and the glory working in us, working on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Just want to take a second to dismiss all of you that are watching online tonight. Thanks again for joining us. Don't forget to go back to mam.tv and uh, there's information there, study materials, things you can look through that will bless your life. Don't forget to join us next week, 7.15. We'll see you next time.